A couple of weeks ago I showed you how to build this awesome electric foundry, but as I stated in the video it was not finished, there are a lot of problems with it and you guys suggested a lot of improvements that I should make, so basically this video is that, me improving this foundry. If you haven't seen the last video where I made the foundry then this video probably won't make any sense to you, so the link is in the description to the last video as well. So this is the finished foundry with a hinging lid, levelling feet and most importantly a pit temperature controller. This pit temperature controller coupled with a solid state relay is able to control the temperature of the heating element to within 2 degrees anywhere between 0 and 1200 degrees celsius. This is a massive improvement over the foundry before since before it was either turned on or turned off and this means that you can melt your metals to a specific temperature to cast them and you can find the perfect temperature that you want to cast them at. The lid hinges nicely on and off and you can easily just slide it open using the hook that I also use for my crucible. So now I'm going to show you how I made all of these upgrades. Firstly I wanted to get my pit temperature controller up and running since that is going to be the most important upgrade in this build. To connect everything I'm going to be using the steel core wire which is fiberglass insulated and can withstand up to 600 degrees celsius, a massive improvement over the PVC coated wire that I was using previously. So firstly I cut off two lengths and strip the ends. These are all of the electronic components that you're going to need. On the left I've got the pit temperature controller and then in the middle I've got a solid state relay that can switch up to 45 amps and on the right I've got a high temperature 1200 degrees celsius type K thermocouple. My pit controller did come with a smaller thermocouple but that was only rated to 400 degrees celsius so I'm not going to be using it. There will be a link to where I bought all of these in the description down below. Now I'm going to be wiring the PID to the wiring diagram that it has on the side and this is pretty much different for all the different types of controllers but they all have the same general theme but they go into different numbered pins. I drew up my own wiring diagram for this specific model of PID if you're using this one so hopefully it'll help you out. Each wire as I connect it I just twist it up and screw it into these terminal blocks. Terminal 10 is going to be connected to the neutral wire and terminal 9 is going to be connected to the live wire. Make sure that when you're connecting anything into a terminal block you push it all the way in so that there's no bare wire exposed on the outside of the terminal and it connects all the way up to the insulation. I then cut, stripped and twisted some more wire and put it into terminal 8 and 6. Terminal 6 then goes to terminal 4 on the solid state relay and terminal 8 goes to terminal 3 on the solid state relay. These are actually the output terminals from the PID and they send a small DC pulse to the solid state relay telling it whether to turn on or off and that's what controls whether the heating coil inside the forge is on or off. Then more wire is connected to terminal 1 and 2 of the solid state relay. I take the wire from terminal 9 on the PID and the wire from terminal 2 on the solid state relay and connect them together and these are both going to be connected to the live wire. Pin 1 from the solid state relay is then what's going to go to the resistor which is going to be the heating element. For this demonstration I'm just going to be using a light bulb. When I actually connect this to the forge this light bulb will be replaced with the heating coil. I then take a second wire and attach it to the other side of the resistor. This wire is then connected up to the wire which comes from terminal 10 of the PID controller and they are both connected together and connected to the neutral wire. I then take the connections of the two wires and solder them to the live and the neutral wires of a plug. I use some heat shrink tubing just to cover up all of the joints. I then take the two wires that are coming off my thermocouple and attach them into pin 3 and 4 and then I bridge pin 4 and 5 so that they're both connected together just using a small piece of wire. It actually turned out that I connected the red and the blue on the wrong side and as I heated up my thermocouple it would read as if it was cooling down so I needed to switch them over in the end. Once I plug it in this is what showed up and you can see that it reads as 114 degrees celsius but it obviously isn't so I need to actually calibrate the thermometer. That's done by holding down the set button and flicking through the different options and values that you can set until I get to sensor calibration. There I can raise or lower the value until it's the actual value of room temperature which I can measure with my infrared thermometer. So this is what it looks like once I've got it all set up and working and I've just got the thermocouple held really close to the light bulb so once the light bulb is on it will heat up the thermocouple. I can set the exact temperature that I want it to heat up to and it will basically heat up to that temperature and then try and keep it as best as it can within 2 degrees of that temperature. It does this simply by pulsing the light bulb on and off and it will do the same thing with the heating element. It's now time to replace the light bulb with the actual foundry itself. However as I was upgrading the forge I decided to do a little bit more casting, casting some round stock and my crucible decided to split so I had to make a new crucible. If you want to catch the video where I made this steel crucible then the link will be in the description down below. An unfortunate side effect of my crucible splitting, the whole bottom of the forge was covered in molten aluminium and I need to peel it all off. Unfortunately it's shorted out a couple of coils in the heating element but it should still work properly. 
While I've got the forge apart, I figure it's a good time to paint it, and I'm going to be using a wire wheel on my angle grinder to get rid of all of the mill scale and oxide left on the steel from welding. This leaves the surface nice and shiny and I can then spray it with some high temperature spray paint which can withstand up to 600 degrees celsius and the outside of this forge never gets really above 100 degrees celsius so it should be fine. This quickly dries and I can give it a couple of coats and then I can attach everything back together. Another safety feature that I added was a wire attached into the bolt clamped between the two nuts just as I did with the other connections and I'm going to attach this wire to the earth wire on the plug so that if there is a fault and the live wire manages to touch the casing and the casing becomes electrified it will go to earth, a high current will flow and it will blow the fuse so I won't get electrocuted. Now I'm going to attach the coils of the forge to either end of the wires which were originally attached to the light bulb. I do this the same way as I did it before just by crimping them together with bolts and washers. I then tested out the PID mechanism to see if it would work with the new heating element and it worked really well and now I was able to get it up to about 1000 degrees celsius and it took about 20 minutes to heat up to that temperature. I didn't want to take it any higher because I wouldn't really be using the forge any higher and I also didn't want to damage the coils which are used for the heating element. Once I established that everything was working properly I then drilled a hole in the side of the forge through the steel flat bar and welded on a side panel which is going to help attach my thermocouple. This thermocouple is quite long and it only measures temperature right at the very tip so I can have it inserting all the way through the fire brick and it should be able to measure the temperature very well. It's got a threaded bolt that you can tighten up and make sure that it stays secure and there it is just poking out the side right into the middle of the forge. For my particular PID controller I can then set it onto self calibration mode by scrolling through the menu, going to control and set the value to 2 and in this mode it configures some of the settings to make it perfect heating and it basically heats up the forge and lets it cool down and sees how often it has to switch on and off the coils so that it doesn't overshoot a certain temperature and it's quite clever. This makes the PID controller much more accurate and much better at sustaining a particular temperature and heating up to the next temperature that you set it at. Taking some ingots that I cast in a previous video, I start to turn them down and these are going to be levelling feet so that the forge doesn't rock about because at the moment the feet aren't quite level. I faced one side and created a shoulder and then I could flip it round, seat it in the three jaw chuck and face the other and make sure that it's flat. I gave it a light chamfer and then gave it a 5mm through hole all the way through. I could then leave my tailstock loose and have an M6 tap inside the drill chuck and slowly turn on the lathe and spin it through and this will thread the hole in the middle. I repeat those steps four times to create four almost identical feet which screw onto the bottom. Now the forge is completely level and doesn't rock and that makes it a lot safer. Next thing to create is a lid for the forge and for this I'm going to be using the sheet steel from a steel baking tray and I'm just using this because it's already got a high temperature paint coating. You could also use very thin mild steel sheet if you wanted or pretty much any other type of steel. I cut out the rough shape of my forge just using an angle grinder and a thin cut off wheel. I used my angle grinder to scratch up one side of the plate. I then centre punched and drilled four different holes and these were 5mm deep and so that I can put some M5 bolts through. I attached some short M5 bolts through the holes and then tightened up nuts really tight on them so they wouldn't come undone. I then took some wire and bent it around the bolts creating sort of a string pattern all the way around the bolts, made sure that it was really tightly wrapped around the bolts so it couldn't come undone and you'll see what this is going to be used for in a minute. The old forge lid was made from the alumina silica fire bricks, but the rapid heating and cooling of these bricks when they were used on the lid has, mean, has meant that over time they have cracked, so I'm not going to be able to use them for a lid anymore. Instead I'm going to be using this 50-50 combination of plaster of Paris and sand, and this is a great refractory coating that I've used in many forges that I've made in the past, and it was originally shown to me by a great video by Nighthawk in Light, and the video will be in the description down below. Here just using a cereal packet I've created a mould all the way around the edges so that when I pour in the plaster of Paris and sand I'm going to make it very liquid and it will flow to the edges and keep the shape of the forge lid that I want. The purpose of the wire is so that the plaster of Paris actually sticks properly to the metal lid on the top and also it will help to hold the plaster of Paris together so it doesn't crack. I mix the plaster of Paris and sand 50-50 by volume and add quite a lot of water so that it's very liquidy and then pour it into the mould. 
I'm just using fine sand from the hardware store and you can pretty much use any sand as long as it's quite clean, even beach sand or play sand. As you can see I've just got a block of aluminium right in the centre which is going to be the hole which I'm going to use for inserting the metal when the forge is on because I want to have a hole in the lid. About 5 minutes after I've finished pouring in all of the plaster of Paris and it's pretty much even, it starts to harden in an exothermic reaction between the plaster of Paris and the water. There's sort of a stage where it's kind of semi-liquid, semi-hard and you can still work on it quite easily so I'm just going to be using a wood rasp to flatten out the surface as much as possible. Then I can remove the mould and the aluminium block in the centre. I can then use the same rasp to begin removing some of the edges and making them completely parallel in the final shape that I want. I then drill a hole out the centre of the sheet metal so the hole is going all the way through the entire lid. I then clean it up using a file afterwards. I now need to work on attaching the lid to the hinge which it's going to pivot on. I'm going to be doing this with steel flat bar so I use a step drill to drill a 12mm hole all the way through some steel flat bar. I then cut it off at an angle and do it the same thing with another one, then I can place it on the lid and weld it all together. I weld various bits of steel flat bar together to create a sort of A frame which is going to attach onto the top of the lid and this frame is going to be welded onto the bolts which go through the plaster of Paris so it's all going to be held together very strongly. As I did with all of the other metal parts, I ground all the weld beads smooth and then sprayed it with the high temperature spray paint. Using a large drill bit, I then countersunk all of the holes which were going to be welded. I then clapped on a piece of square steel tube on the side of the forge where I want the lid to attach on and this is going to act as the pivot. I then welded on using my arc welder. Unfortunately this steel was really thin and I made a horrible job of welding and created a hole in it, but it doesn't matter since this is on the other side of the forge and I won't actually see it. Once that's welded on, a 10mm steel rod fits very nicely inside it. I drilled a hole in the side of the steel rod and welded in a small nail which is going to act as a little pin. Once this is inserted into the hinge it means that I can push down the lid and it will be locked into place so it won't be able to spin and to turn it I'll have to lift it up slightly so it's not going to grind against the top of the forge. I took the A-frame that I made previously which is going to attach to the top of the lid and I welded it onto the hinge. Once this is cooled I inserted it into the hinge and put the lid in position and then I welded the A-frame onto all of the bolts protruding out the top of the lid. I also welded on a piece of bent M8 threaded rod which makes a little hook that I can lift up with the hook from my crucible. And as you can see the lid functions very nicely. The final upgrade that I'm going to make is going to be a small enclosure for all of the electronics. I'm going to be making this out of wood so that it electrically insulates them from the rest of the kiln. I cut out a small square of plywood and then marked on where the PID and the SSR need to attach. I can then drill four holes and cut out a slot for the PID controller's face to fit through. I cut some side panels and just glued them together using wood glue. Once all of the panels are dry and the box is quite solid, I use a large rasp to file everything smooth. I shorten all of the power cables now that they fit nicely and I know the exact lengths that I need, and I solder them onto a very long cable that I salvaged from an old iron which has a nice fray proof coating which should protect it. This cable is about 2 meters long. I made sure also to solder the earth wire to the wire that I connected to the frame earlier. I also added a strain relief for the cord so that if you pull on it, it just pulls on the casing instead. The back of the box was just screwed on using wood screws so if I ever do want to go inside and fix the electronics if they break, it's quite easy just to remove them. I covered the screen of the pit with masking tape and spray painted the entire box black so that it fits in with the aesthetics of the forge. Using even more steel flat bar I welded on a mounting bracket on the side. Two screws hold the electronics box in place so that it's very secure and doesn't move. The forge is then complete and I'm really really pleased with the way that it turned out and I hope that you appreciate all of the effort that I've put into making and editing these series of videos right in the middle of my GCSEs. The total cost of the forge cost me about £100 including all of the extra things like bolts and all the wires and things like that and that's much cheaper than the alternatives that are on the internet that cost around 200 or 300 pounds and they don't melt nowhere near as much volume as this one melts and they're probably not as powerful either. I'm also really pleased with the PID controller, it works almost flawlessly and it controls the temperature very very well. 
The forge is able to hold a much larger crucible and I have ordered some new square steel tubing to make an even larger crucible, so hopefully that will be a future project. If you've got any specific projects that you think would be fun to cast out of aluminium, I can now cast metal quite easily, so please leave them in the comments section down below and I'll have a look and see if I'll be able to make some of them. If you want to help support my channel please like and share the video and also subscribe if you want to catch future videos. If you're going to get up to 5 days early access to videos and new updates on projects as I make them, consider supporting me on Patreon and also follow me on Instagram for new updates on projects. Both the links are in the description down below.